The solar system is characterized by radical and extreme weather patterns, from the chaos on outer planets to the intense climate on Earth's closest neighbor. The sun's influence drives our planet's weather, occasionally leading to wild atmospheric interactions when hot and cold collide. However, weather phenomena on other planets surpass Earth's extremes in terms of speed, dustiness, wetness, and ferocity. On Mars, a planet half the size of Earth and 50% further from the sun, a global dust storm currently rages. This storm blocks 99% of the sun's rays from reaching the Martian surface, generating smaller but still massive storms that disperse dust high into the atmosphere. As a result, it takes months for the Martian skies to clear after such an event. The Martian weather is vastly different due to several factors. Mars' smaller size and greater distance from the sun result in significantly lower temperatures, averaging at minus 80 degrees Celsius. Additionally, its thin atmosphere, mainly composed of carbon dioxide, contributes to its desert-like conditions with minimal liquid water or atmospheric moisture. Consequently, the absence of water leads to widespread dust storms that generate their own weather on Mars, in contrast to Earth's localized and short-lived storms. Scientists at NASA discovered the surprising role of Martian dust devils in maintaining the functionality of solar panels on the rovers, Spirit, and Opportunity. Contrary to expectations, as dust accumulated on the panels, the rovers observed that dust devils cleaned them off, preventing the anticipated loss of power. This unexpected revelation provided valuable insights into the unique weather dynamics that shape Mars' environment. In summary, the solar system's diverse weather patterns are driven by fundamental laws of nature, but each planet's specific conditions, such as size, distance from the sun, atmospheric composition, and availability of water, give rise to distinct and often more extreme weather phenomena than those experienced on Earth. Having some problems? There are beautiful photos that actually show dust devils moving across the Martian atmosphere and ghostly soldiers moving out there in the distance. A dust devil is really an extreme form of rising hot air or convection, and that hot air wants to go up. It comes up, just like you know, water going down a drain. Well, this is air that just spirals up into the colder parts of the atmosphere. Whenever warmer air, which is less dense, rises up through cooler air, which is more dense, it rotates as it swirls upwards. Convection can be very powerful, strong enough to lift things up. On Earth, it lifts moisture, and that's how thunderstorms form. But on Mars, there is no moisture, so it lifts dry, dark dust and creates giant dust storms instead. Once airborne, Martian dust clouds absorb sunlight and heat the atmosphere. This supercharges the convection, lifting still more dust that produces more winds, which bring up more dust. These things can spread up to thousands of miles across, or even in some cases, they can envelop the entire planet. And because the Martian atmosphere is so thin, it doesn't take much to get this cycle going. You get a lot more difference between the surface temperature and the eye temperature, and so the convection on Mars is very much more vigorous as a rule. Earth doesn't get the temperature extremes that Mars does, but sometimes here and there, in the deserts of Earth, convection can be very Martian-like. We get dust devils too, but at Arizona State University, Lynn Nurkake makes dust devils to order in a lab to study them up close. He uses a vortex generator and substitutes lighter dry ice for dust. What he creates is not an exact replica of how real dust devils form, but good enough to see how they pick up dust and debris. Okay, dust devils usually form from the bottom up, as opposed to tornadoes, which form from top down. So what happens when we turn this on? We have the airflow starting, and as the airflow starts to rotate from the fans down to the floor, we actually end up having the vortex form. In other words, the vortex generator, basically a huge vacuum cleaner, imitates the swirling action of convection. You can see here, there's a wider base where larger particles of the dry ice are being swept up, and it gets wrapped up and tightens as it expands upward. The center of the core is where the majority of the lifting would occur. Martian dust devils have been helpful keeping the rovers clean, yet making a mess of the rest of the planet. Some scientists think there are so many at any one time, and they lift so much dust into the atmosphere that together they trigger these much larger dust storms. Its wind patterns, 
and there's warm air over here. And it's colder so over here dust over the, the whole planet. And we found measurements that indicate there's up to maybe 200 dust devils per square mile per day during some parts of the summer. And they can range from a couple of hundred feet tall to devils that stretch six or seven miles high. You can get just towering monsters of dust devils that we would never see on the Earth. The kind of maximum size dust devils you see on Mars are more like tornadoes on the Earth, where they're going up almost 10 kilometers. So these things are just real monster systems. Back at Arizona State University, scientists blow crushed walnut shells and silicate particles in the planetary geology wind tunnel to replicate dust and wind conditions on Mars. We can understand and sort of replicate what's going on. Then we can, in a sense, understand how the Martian surface has been changing and continues to change as time goes on. Actually found that sand seemed to have bounced onto the solar panels and we can see the skip marks across the surface. This is interesting because we don't usually see sand typically reach that high. Dust devils on Earth never have the punch to produce that kind of chaos here, lucky for us. But what would happen to Earth if a giant Martian-style dust storm did overtake us? If you had dust storms of Martian size on Earth, you would find your city being enveloped in an orange-tan haze, air quality plunges as the storm churns, the dust blots out the sun shutting down photosynthesis. No plants, no food. Temperatures would plummet. 65 million years ago, an asteroid may have struck the Earth, creating these same conditions, wiping out the dinosaurs. It's not going to happen on the Earth, though, because there's going to be rainfall and moisture condensing on the dust grains and so forth and dropping them out of the atmosphere. So it's very hard for something like that to spread in the climate conditions that we have on Earth. Forecasting Martian weather may someday be just as important as forecasting the weather on Earth. If we ever want to send a manned mission there, the word environment no longer really applies just to the meadow next door and the little stream down at the end of town. It's the whole inner solar system. I mean, that's really our environment now. The sun's energy bathes all the planets. On Earth, it creates hurricanes. On Mars, planet-wide dust storms. But with almost no solar energy, Distant Neptune produces violent and powerful winds. Where do they come from, and just how bad are they? Neptune's winds were to travel to Earth. These alien storms would literally blow us away. The orbit of Neptune lies 3 billion miles from the Sun, at the outer edge of the solar system. There's a lot we don't know about this big blue planet. Jet stream winds blast as fast as 1,500 miles an hour in its upper atmosphere, but how? Thank you, the sun controls the weather on Earth and Mars, but it barely reaches out here. No sunlight means freezing temperatures, an average of minus 392 degrees Fahrenheit. So if there's no sun and no heat, where do these incredible winds come from? One of the interesting puzzles is that as you go further out in the solar system, you get further from the sun, the winds don't go down, you still get very strong winds. The energy for Neptune's winds must come from somewhere, and scientists are working to figure it out. Neptune's energy is certainly not going to be powered by solar radiation. In fact, the energy we detect coming out from the planet and the infrared as heat is two and a half times the energy coming in from the sun. So the planet is creating its own heat, not from its core, which is made of rock and ice, but wrapped around this icy center is a mantle of ammonia, methane, and water, all being squeezed by enormous pressure and generating tons of heat. So while Neptune is frigid on the outside, on the inside it's giving off a lot of heat. This heat may help generate Neptune's winds, but they're still too strong to come from the mantle alone. Well, something else is pushing them faster and faster. Earth has a hot core too, and it's a lot closer to the sun. So why don't we have winds like Neptune? For one thing, our oceans store and release energy, and that helps generate our weather. My dad's energy in places takes it out in others in a very complicated system. This complicated system produces a lot of wind, and just where are Earth's fastest winds found? Surprisingly, not over the ocean. They blow instead over the top of a fairly modestly sized mountain, New Hampshire's Mount Washington. The highest winds ever observed by human beings were right here on Mount Washington at 231 miles an hour on April 12, 1934. Mount Washington Observatory, 
a private nonprofit scientific institution, is responsible for tracking the weather and climate atop locations on the planet. We regularly see, in the wintertime, winds exceeding 100 miles per hour every few days. Nowhere near as ferocious as Neptune, yet still pretty strong. But why does this mountain, one-fifth the size of Everest, produce such fierce gusts? We have winds converging from various directions, coming from the Ohio River Valley, coming down from the St. Lawrence River Valley, coming up the eastern seaboard, all converging here in this area on top of Mount Washington. The elevation change from the valley floor to the summit of Mount Washington is very significant. For any mountain range, it's over 4,000 feet, so air is forced to go over the mountaintop and forced to squeeze in there and gets accelerated as it squeezes over the mountaintop. They measure it every hour on the hour, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week out. Here right now, ice is forming on the instruments more quickly. It's time to go off, but the ice jams the instruments even though it's blowing over a hundred. We gotta do it every hour now. Ironically, Earth's uneven surface, which channels winds into powerful gusts on Mount Washington, ultimately knocks them down over time for sand, and this is the big difference between weather on Earth and weather on Neptune. Earth has mountains that slow winds down, Neptune is as smooth as a cue ball. It's not so much a question of your driving them stronger, because you're not, it's just that there's nothing to slow them down. Simply put, once Neptune's winds get blowing, there's nothing to get in their way. So what would an average Neptune wind speed of 850 miles an hour do to us here on Earth? We have parking level winds in the Earth, sometimes of 100 miles an hour. I consider that pretty dangerous, so if we sat with 900 mile an hour winds from Neptune on the Earth, we would probably start wiping out everything on the surface and scraping everything off. Giant Neptune takes wind and transforms it into something extreme and almost unrecognizable, but orbiting just beyond the rings of Saturn is a small moon that does the same thing to rain. This is Titan, where an everyday rain shower will turn Earth into an explosive fireball. It's a cloudy day and a gentle rainstorm starts. Here on Earth, you'd grab your umbrella and consider it a minor inconvenience. But this isn't Earth, and it's no ordinary rain. You're on Titan, a small moon of Saturn, and in this chemical downpour, you'd need more than an umbrella to protect you. The rules of Earth weather definitely don't apply here. But Earth and Titan are alike in a lot of ways. On Earth, we have a solid surface, a protective atmosphere, and plenty of water. All these things make life on our planet possible. There's really nowhere else quite like Earth anywhere in the solar system. Close to Earth, it has a solid surface. That's not all. Titan has an atmosphere that's in general very similar to Earth. In some ways, it's mainly nitrogen like Earth's atmosphere. It's rich with organic material, also like Earth's atmosphere. But similar isn't the same. Here on Earth, our atmosphere has a huge supply of water in it all the time, constantly evaporating and raining back down. Like here on the Hawaiian island of Kauai today, we're on the slopes of Maleluka, which is the cloud-shrouded mountain behind us. It rains over 40 feet a year here. Earth's water cycle starts when warm, moist ocean air rises, forming clouds that eventually condense into rain. The rain falls back onto the land where it eventually drains back into the ocean, starting the cycle again. When water evaporates, it absorbs solar radiation. When water condenses, it releases all that energy into the atmosphere. And this transfer of heat helps to moderate conditions. Scientists theorize that Titan might have water or some other liquid that might produce a similar effect. In 2004, when NASA's Cassini probe visited Saturn, it found some pretty good evidence to support that idea. Valleys that were carved out by running liquids. In fact, as Cassini flew past Hazy Titan, its radar read the surface below. Scientists saw channels cutting across the surface, much like rivers on Earth do, some as long as 900 miles, the first strong evidence of liquid on Titan. There are large bodies of liquid on the surface of Titan. Nowhere else in the solar system, except for the Earth, are there any large bodies of liquids? Could water, the liquid that carves Earth's mountains and valleys, also be carving these features on Titan's surface? Or could it be something else? The problem is that Titan is too far away from the Sun, 
If it was water, it would be frozen solid about minus 300 Fahrenheit on Titan. So things behave very differently on Titan than on Earth because it's so cold. Methane, which is a gas on Earth, but it's just because methane Titan. is a liquid on Titan's surface doesn't mean it's part of a weather cycle like water on Earth. So how do we know that this methane also falls from Titan's sky? That answer is shrouded in mystery, literally. Titan is completely covered in a thick haze of smog particles, like a very, very bad day in Los Angeles. Despite the haze, the Cassini Pro once again revealed the answer. We can see the upper clouds, and we can see evidence for rainfall because the clouds drop very precipitously. We hypothesize that we're seeing the effects of rainfall, methane rainfall. We think that Titan has methane monsoons. So we think that sometimes Titan has a lot of rain that is able to carve rivers and leave large fluvial deposits on the surface. Radar imaging also revealed large methane seas on Titan's surface. If you have liquid methane on the surface, and a lake, for example, that methane can evaporate off and become methane gas in the atmosphere. So you have kind of a cycling of methane between liquid phase and gaseous phase, and between the surface and the atmosphere. That's very similar to the water cycle that occurs on Earth. But methane is a flammable gas, so why isn't Titan on fire? For any combustion, you need two things, a fuel, which methane is, and oxygen. On Titan, there is a lack of oxygen, so the whole thing is basically a big fuel canister, but there's no oxygen with which to burn it, and so it's all very stable. Here on Earth, to produce methane rain, the oxygen in our atmosphere would create a worldwide firestorm. Luckily for us, that can't happen. Titan's methane cycle makes it both alien and familiar to us. Titan is very exciting because all the materials are so different and yet this process produces very similar landscapes to what we see on Earth. Titan proves that where alien weather is concerned, looks can be deceiving. On Jupiter, it's all about size. Drop the great red spot onto our world, and it makes even our worst hurricanes look like a breeze. Foreign, this is the biggest and oldest storm in the solar system and Jupiter's most famous feature. It even has its own name, the great red spot. It's about two or three times the size of the Earth, which makes it the mother of all storms. We've known about the Great Red Spot in Jupiter's southern hemisphere for more than 300 years. When Galileo invented the telescope, within a few tens of years, people had seen the Great Red Spot and it's still there. Familiar yet mysterious, nobody knows how the Great Red Spot formed, but scientists are finally probing below Jupiter's cloud tops to uncover more about this enormous alien storm. The storm is powerful, with wind speeds of 300 miles per hour. It rises miles above the surrounding clouds. On Earth, we have storms that seem similar. Those smaller and milder hurricanes, also known as cyclones or typhoons depending on where they form, they're our most destructive weather systems. But is there more than just a passing resemblance between Earth's cyclones and Jupiter's great red spot? When you look at the Earth from space, at a hurricane, it's this big swirling pattern round. It rotates. Jupiter's big storms look big and round and cloudy, and they rotate, but the similarity ends. In a hurricane, there is an internal core, which is called the eye of the tropical cyclone, and that's a region of very calm winds and no clouds, and usually has a size of about 10 to 20 kilometers in diameter. Then away from the eye, there is the eye wall. Those are really cloudy regions with a lot of rain, and as you move outward, there is a whole region of about a couple of hundred kilometers with very, very strong winds and very strong winds. Hurricanes draw power from heat in our oceans, but Jupiter has no oceans, and the sun isn't close enough to power a storm as big as the Great Red Spot, so where does it get its strength? Part of the answer is Jupiter's size. It's the largest planet in the solar system, almost as big as all the other planets combined. This mass generates a very strong gravitational pull, which in turn creates interior heat that rises to the surface. Another piece of the puzzle may be Jupiter's hypersonic rotation. Spanning much larger than Earth, Jupiter's day only lasts 10 hours. In other words, it spins incredibly fast. Could energy from this dizzying spin feed the great red spot? 
The weather is really dominated by this fast spin. There's shearing between different latitudes, and that shearing, plus a lot of heat that comes up from the interior of this massive object, 290 times the mass of the Earth, leads to very violent storms. Both Jupiter's and Earth's swarms spin around in a familiar spiral shape. On Earth, it's because of an effect called the Coriolis force. I'm sitting at the North Pole. I want I to throw a ball, ball in that down direction. To a the Earth rotates, it. and the ball will end up in the middle of the Pacific rather than in Los Angeles. So it's like the trajectory was deflected to its right. And that's what we call the Coriolis force. This force spins storms clockwise in our southern hemisphere, but there is a stark difference between Earth and Jupiter. The great red spot is in Jupiter's southern hemisphere, and yet it spins counterclockwise. This is because of some other powerful winds bounded by jets, which are moving in opposite directions, and so, like a cog between two conveyor belts, there's feeding. In Jupiter's complex jet streams, the storm spins into organized chaos, presenting a stark contrast between Jupiter's great red spot and Earth's storms. One notable difference lies in the presence of Earth's solid surface. When a hurricane hits land, it rapidly dissipates, behaving differently from those forming over warm oceans. On the other hand, the lack of a solid surface on Jupiter allows the great red spot to persist and continue its spinning. Scientists aim to gain insights into Earth's weather by studying this phenomenon. Interestingly, while Earth's weather is unpredictable and can be violent, it remains less extreme compared to Jupiter's weather. Prediction models for Jupiter's red spot extend months into the future. This may offer practical value in understanding the factors that contribute to Earth's unpredictable weather. Even if scaled down to fit Earth, the great red spot's intensity would lead to catastrophic consequences, emphasizing the vast differences in alien storms throughout our solar system. Furthermore, Venus, Earth's nearest neighbor, exhibits drastically different weather from that on Earth, with surface temperatures of 900 degrees Fahrenheit and surface pressures akin to half a mile below the Earth's ocean, it presents a challenging environment. The atmosphere is filled with sulfuric acid clouds and wings reaching 250 miles per hour. Venus's thick clouds reflect most of the sunlight it receives, contributing to its extreme conditions. The planet's atmosphere, consisting of 97% carbon dioxide, induces a powerful greenhouse effect trapping heat and resulting in exceptionally high atmospheric temperatures. These differences in atmospheric composition between Earth and Venus, despite their shared history and similar sizes, are linked to their divergent paths. While Earth fostered life and sequestered most of its carbon in life forms and rocks, Venus's proximity to the sun led to the evaporation of its water, initiating a runaway greenhouse effect. This atmospheric disparity demonstrates how small variations can lead to drastically different planetary weather phenomena. The scientific community's understanding of the greenhouse effect was significantly influenced by expeditions to Venus, which revealed its extreme surface temperatures, reaching 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Starting in the 1960s, both the United States and the Soviet Union sent unmanned probes to Venus, but the planet's hostile conditions led to the failure of these missions. In 1981, the Soviet lander Venera 13 briefly survived on the surface, providing valuable images and samples before succumbing to the intense heat. There is hope for future missions to Venus that can endure its harsh environment to further our understanding of the planet's divergence from Earth. The potential alternate path for Venus, one that mirrors Earth's conditions, serves as a stark reminder of the delicate balance within planetary atmospheres. If Earth were to lose its atmospheric shield, the carbon locked in oceanic rocks would lead to a Venus-like environment over millions of years. The contrast between the paths taken by Earth and Venus highlights the profound impact of cosmic forces on planetary destinies. Moving to Saturn, the thunderstorms on this planet are characterized by incredibly powerful lightning capable of growing larger than the entire United States. Despite the extraordinary strength of Saturn's lightning, it remains unseen due to the planet's bright rings and dense ammonia-filled clouds. However, radio wave detectors on the Cassini orbiter have captured the sound of Saturn's lightning, revealing its immense power, estimated to be around 100 times stronger than Earth's lightning. This knowledge aids in understanding storm dynamics on Saturn, 
where supersaturated atmospheric conditions and energy emerging from the planet contribute to the intensity and longevity of its thunderstorms. Ultimately, Saturn's storms, with their larger scale and longer durations, stand as a testament to the unique atmospheric and energetic processes at play on this gas giant, offering valuable comparisons to, in comparison to the systems system. on Saturn. Even a typical mega thunderstorm on Saturn would dwarf anything seen on Earth. If a thunderstorm the size of Saturn were to occur on Earth, it would cover the entire North American continent, likely bringing extremely powerful winds and heavy rain, an occurrence unprecedented on our planet. The hyperviolent thunderstorms on Saturn demonstrate that our planetary neighbors experience weather that is significantly more ferocious than what we encounter. However, the laws of physics governing Saturn's storms are the same laws that govern our own weather. Massive dust storms, relentless winds, powerful hurricanes, killer lightning, and scorching heat make Saturn a planet with weather phenomena so peculiar that not even science fiction could have predicted them. For the first time in history, scientists are exploring alien worlds beyond our solar system, uncharted, unearthly, and unpredictable. Among these new worlds, researchers seek the most significant discoveries of all, planets similar to our own or alien Earths. The Delta I rocket undergoes final pre-flight checks, marking the beginning of a remarkably ambitious mission. The Kepler Space Observatory aims to locate planets akin to Earth within a region containing 100,000 stars. This effort is the culmination of a journey that commenced more than a decade ago, following one of the most profound scientific breakthroughs ever made. In 1995, Swiss astronomer Michael Mayer and his team made a routine observation of stars in the constellation Pegasus, located 50 light years away. Their instruments detected an anomaly. One star was exhibiting violent lurching and wobbling. This abnormal behavior led Mayer to propose a radical explanation, the presence of a planet. The challenge in detecting planets around other stars stems from the difficulty of distinguishing their faint light amidst the glare of the star. Despite initial skepticism, subsequent observations confirmed Mayer's findings and the existence of a planet around a sun-like star, officially known as 51 Pegasi, nicknamed Bellerophon. This planet defies convention, roasting in the blazing starlight at temperatures around 1800 degrees Fahrenheit and boasting a mass approximately 150 times that of Earth. It is a gas giant, primarily composed of hydrogen and helium, with compressed inner layers that deviate from any known celestial body in our solar system, fitting into a new planetary category termed hot Jupiters. Hot Jupiters are located three to four stellar diameters away from their stars, rendering them in extremely close proximity to receive an exceptionally large amount of sunlight, approximately 10,000 times more than Earth. Additionally, they are tidally locked, bearing a permanent daytime and nighttime side due to their close orbiting nature. The dramatic temperature differentials within the atmosphere of Bellerophon contribute to extremely high winds, reaching speeds of thousands of miles per hour, far surpassing anything experienced on Earth. The newly discovered world of Bellerophon boasts extreme heat that guarantees the absence of water vapor and liquid clouds, yet iron vapor can exist in its atmosphere. This iron vapor, however, would rapidly coat and weigh down any objects, such as an umbrella, making them extremely heavy and eventually crushing them. Furthermore, the charged particles from the nearby star create auroras much more intense than Earth's northern lights, adding to the uniqueness of this planet. Bellerophon's orbit of 4.2 days challenges conventional understandings of planet formation, suggesting that planets may migrate inwards over time. For scientists, understanding this phenomenon was akin to solving a puzzle, revealing that planets form as a byproduct of star formation developing from debris disks around stars. Evidence from the Hubble Space Telescope, particularly observations in regions like the Eagle Nebula, aids in understanding the formation of planets as dust and gas collapse, leading to the growth of asteroids and eventually planets. Planets may then migrate through the debris disk until they settle into a stable orbit, shedding light on why Bellerophon orbits so close to its parent star. Focusing on another hot Jupiter, Osiris, 
It epitomizes extreme conditions as it broils at temperatures over 2,000 degrees and loses approximately 550,000 tons of air every second due to its proximity to its sun. This loss creates a colossal trail of gas trailing behind the planet for thousands of miles, presenting an exceptional opportunity for astronomers to analyze its bloated atmosphere. While Hubble has detected basic chemicals needed for life in Ozer's atmosphere, the extreme Astronomer heat Jeff makes Marcy's it a discovery of a life. planet orbiting a star named 16 Cygnus b, located 70 light years away in the Cygnus constellation, revealed an elongated orbit that defied the typically circular orbits seen in our solar system. This gas giant swings dramatically close to and far from its host star, resulting in extreme seasonal variations that impact any potential moons it may have. Marcy speculates that one of these moons could resemble Earth with lakes, oceans, streams, and waterfalls orbiting the Yo-Yo planet, which itself orbits the host star. The elongated orbit causes drastic seasonal changes, with the closest approach to the star resulting in scorching temperatures, leading to evaporation and extreme storms. This intense summer season, lasting only two months, is followed by a retreat from the star bringing temperate and comfortable conditions akin to Earth's fall, replenishing dry ocean basins, and forming new shorelines. The subsequent winter, lasting 17 months, sees temperatures plummet and ice form, with spring ushering in a brief, balmy period. The elliptical orbit of the planet and its moon crosses the star's Goldilocks zone twice a year for brief periods, where conditions are conducive to life, resembling Earth's abundance of life. Marcy speculates that life forms on this moon might adapt to hibernate during extreme seasons. This remarkable planetary system presents an opportunity to explore the potential for life outside the conventional habitable zone, showcasing the adaptability of life in challenging environments reminiscent of Earth's tidal zones. The Yo-Yo planet's orbit creates brief and fluctuating conditions suitable for life, but also poses threats to it. In contrast, there are even more bizarre alien planets, like the hypothetical rogue planets adrift in interstellar space. These planimos, planets without a host star, result from gravitational interactions and can harbor potential life, particularly if they retain an atmosphere and possess internal heat. Even gas giant planimos may have moons with potential for life due to internal friction generated heat. Life on such planets would likely consist of single-celled organisms deriving energy from chemical reactions, similar to bacteria found deep within Earth's mine shafts. In contrast, pulsars, such as the lethal pulsar in the constellation of Virgo, emit deadly radiation, making them inhospitable for planets. Yet, some astronomers believe the anomaly in the precision of this pulsar may be caused by a planet challenging conventional assumptions about planets surviving the explosive formation of a pulsar. The environment around a pulsar is hostile, with radiation breaking down organic molecules required for life, creating significant challenges for the existence of life on these pulsar-orbiting planets. Strong magnetic fields are being spun around as the star rotates quickly, picking up materials such as electrons and protons, and slinging them out at high speeds, creating a solar wind with intense force. It's inconceivable that even simple microbial life could emerge and flourish on a planet around a pulsar, given the severe energization within the pulse and the lack of energy outside of it. The discovery of pulsar planets demonstrates how new worlds can form in the aftermath of a star's destruction. The process of planetary birth is fraught with danger, sometimes leading to the end of a world before its beginning. In 2007, Astronomers using the giant Jimmy North Telescope made a peculiar discovery in the Pleiades Cluster, around 400 light-years from Earth. A star known only by its catalog number, HD 23514, is surrounded by a giant donut-shaped cloud of dust and gas. Spectral analysis reveals pulverized dust, indicating recent planet formation around the young star and a protoplanetary disk of gas and dust. Millions of years ago, two primordial planets orbiting HD 23514 were on a collision course resulting in their annihilation, creating the observed dust and debris. A similar phenomenon occurred on Earth 4 billion years ago, leading to the creation of the Moon. 
Collisions are an inherent part of the birth process for planetary systems, forming terrestrial planets through the collision and coalescence of rock pieces all across the galaxy. Beyond these tumultuous beginnings, a new type of planet has emerged, the super-Earth, with up to ten times the mass of Earth. Glyce 581c, a super-Earth discovered by Michael Mayer, orbits a very small star, offering the possibility of liquid water and an environment akin to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. This ocean planet presents an exciting prospect for scientific exploration, Place to and sail. the potential discovery the weather is absolutely perfect every day. You get a clear blue sky, and the sun just stays in the same place. Now, how's that for weather prediction? No land even miles beneath the surface. This water layer would extend very far down, at least a quarter of the way down in the planet. But as we dive deeper into the sea, pressure builds. At 35,000 feet below the surface, we pass the point where the deepest oceans on Earth bottom out. We pass the 100,000 foot mark. The pressure is so great, water itself begins to take on surprising new forms. At a depth of 10 times the greatest ocean depth on Earth, we reach the bottom. When you have a large amount of water at the bottom of an ocean, you will form very high pressure in excess of a million atmospheres, and that pressure will compress the liquid water, that is the ocean, into a state which we call ice 7. No, it's not like ice in your refrigerator. The molecules of water in your refrigerator's ice are kind of all jumbled up. But if you form ice under very high pressure, then the water molecules can become ordered, they can become aligned. I can show you a crystal that is a very good analog to ice 7. This is halite, also known commonly as rock salt. Ice 7 may exist within our own solar system. Europa, a moon of Jupiter, could possibly have a mantle of liquid water surrounded by a thick icy crust. The pressure from the crust is so great that ice 7 might exist deep within these uncharted seas. If we scale up and thaw out Europa, it could be a water world similar to Glyce of 581 C. One could imagine that life could emerge on a water world. After all, water is essential to life on Earth. Everywhere on Earth where there is water, there is life. You cannot find a sterile drop of water on Earth unless you put it in the microwave yourself. On this water world, there could be bacteria or any kind of life in the ocean itself. But not all of the super-Earths are water worlds teeming with life. When we talk about super-Earths, we talk about two major families, mostly rocky with some water, and mostly water with an endless ocean. But one has to add to those a third family of probably very rare super-Earths and Earth-like planets, which are called carbon planets. A carbon planet is unlike anything we've ever seen anywhere, a place with an alien chemistry but loaded with very earthly treasures. Throughout our galaxy there are planets barren, poor, and inhospitable. But science is on the trail of a new type of planet, an entire world of treasure. In our own solar system, in our sun, and in all the stars nearby, there's always more oxygen than carbon. But if we think of a place in the universe where there's more carbon than oxygen, then planet formation is very different. Spectral analysis shows carbon to be far more plentiful 26,000 light years away, near the center of our galaxy. Planets that form here may contain a rich abundance of carbon. The morning sky on a carbon planet would be anything but crystal clear and blue. I'm picturing a yellow haze with black clouds of soot, and as you descended farther down in the atmosphere, I could imagine lakes that were made out of compounds like methane or gasoline. I'm picturing these bubbling, foul-smelling pits of black ooze like an oil well. With little or no water in the atmosphere, the air is made of carbon compounds, methane, butane, pentane, benzene, all these different kinds of carbon compounds that separate out when you refine gasoline. One day, it might be raining benzene. The next day, it might be raining butane. Alien as carbon planets might seem, the air quality could be familiar to some. The air in a very benzene-rich planet will resemble that of LO, but with a lot of small particles that unfortunately we are quite used to from the exhaust of cars and the pollution. Urban planets could come with a sparkling upside. You might see diamond because the planet may have substantial quantities of pure carbon that it's formed out of. Then, pure carbon, 
when you compress it, tends to form into diamond. The secrets of exotic planets like these are waiting to be discovered all across the galaxy. Oh, but astronomers won't be satisfied until they find the Holy Grail, a planet like our own, one that sustains life. People always ask me, do I think we're going to find another planet like Earth? And I answer, absolutely. Every star we probably has essentially every star has several Earth Earth. mass or super Earth mass planets. So if you have, say, 200 billion stars in the galaxy, that may mean there are 400 billion Earths in the galaxy or more. 400 billion Earths. The Kepler Space Observatory is the first instrument capable of finding one of these planets. Kepler is looking at the constellation Cygnus in the night sky at 100,000 stars, taking picture after picture after picture, minute after minute. The goal of Kepler is simple, to look for stars among the 100,000 that dim when a star dims slightly. It means a planet passes in front, blocking some of the light. How long the star dims and how much light gets blocked will tell scientists about the size of the planet and the distance from its sun. A good analogy for this is looking for the dip in the light that you would see from a searchlight if a small moth flew across the searchlight. So it's a really tiny dip in the light. As the planet transits, it is a very powerful technique because it allows you to discover planets that are even smaller than the size of the Earth around stars similar to the Sun. Through science, we think we may be able to find a planet that is habitable in the next few years. Scientists estimate the Kepler mission will find a minimum of 50 alien Earths. One of the big questions that anybody looking for life beyond the Earth is facing today is, what if we don't recognize life even though we discover it? Conditions on an alien Earth may cause life to evolve differently. My hope is that we'll see some sign that will make our hairs stand up on the back of our necks. Whatever that sign is, it will be the first chapter on the greatest scientific story ever told. Thank you. 2017 was a busy year for scientists of all sorts, the professional and the enthusiasts alike. From a predictable astronomical rarity to surprise discoveries deep underground, it was a year that saw long-held beliefs challenged by newly found wonders breakthroughs that led to innovations and a glimpse of 130 million years into the past. In August 2017, alarms sounded at the most sensitive scientific devices ever constructed in Washington state. The Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, detected faint disturbances from deep space. The signal also hit LIGO's sister facility in Louisiana. Gravitational waves had reached Earth. Gravitational waves are ripples in space-time. Space-time is incredibly dense, so to cause ripples, you have to have some sort of object that has enormous gravity, like a black hole or a neutron star. When these objects are rapidly accelerating, they bend space-time and create these ripples that then travel through the universe to our detectors on Earth, like the one last August. On high alert, the La Igeo team quickly reached out to Virgo its European counterpart in Italy, who confirmed that they too had detected gravitational waves. And then, if by destiny, the stars would align once more to pave the way to a groundbreaking discovery. Just two seconds later, with the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, we detected a short, bright flash of high-energy light that we call a gamma ray burst. This alerted the entire astronomical community to the fact that something very exciting was happening. Using data collected from LIGO, Virgo, and Fermi, 70 ground and space-based telescopes scarred the edge of galaxy NGC 4993, some 130 million light years away from Earth, searching for a small flash of light amidst a sea of stars. It would take less than 12 hours after the alarms rang at LIGO for Earth to have visual confirmation of a never-before-seen astronomical event. What we saw was the result of the merging of two neutron stars, when they merged, they created an explosion in space-time. Those ripples went out across the universe as gravitational waves and were detected on Earth. The matter involved gave off gamma rays and other forms of light. Neutron stars are the collapsed cores of massive stars left behind after a supernova explosion. No larger than a mid-sized city, these dense stars have 10 to 60% more mass than our sun. This pair of stars, 200 miles apart, were locked in each other's orbit for over 11 billion years. But as they started accelerating and moving inwards, 
Their orbit quickened from 30 times a second to an astonishing and unsustainable 2,000 orbits a second. Then, 130 million years ago, they collided in a resounding explosion. Peering into the past, telescope stars have densities and temperatures completely unlike anything on Earth. The violent explosion produced 200 Earth masses worth of gold and 500 Earth masses of platinum, revealing the origins of heavy metals in our galaxy for the first time. We think that all the gold in the universe was formed in explosions of this kind. After the explosion, the gold is spread out into the gas and dust of the interstellar medium. Later on, that gas and dust collapses into brand new stars and brand new planetary systems. These weren't the first gravitational waves detected by Eligio this year. Two separate events have been measured before, including a pair of monstrous black holes that collided to form a single spinning hole 53 times more massive than the Sun. We received a perfect signal from this last merger, which traveled 3 billion light years to get here. In any given galaxy, one of these events might only happen once every million years, but we're now able to monitor about 10 million galaxies at a time. It's a new type of astronomy. While we wait for gravitational waves that can open a window on the origins of our universe, seismic activity off the coast of Japan is presenting scientists with a picture of Earth's early history when land first rose from the seas. Violent eruptions spew a steady stream of lava and rocks, expanding the newly emerged island of Nishinoshima to three square kilometers in just five short months. The most recent blasts stopped in August but could resume at any time. Situated atop the junction of four tectonic plates, the Japanese islands offer stunning insights about the formation of a variety of landscapes. Analysis of Nishinoshima's magma shows it to be anesthetic similar to the composition of continental crust. Geologists hope to learn more about the forces that led to the birth of the world's eighth continent. In February 2017, the Geological Society of America published a startling paper, Zealandia, Earth's Hidden Continent. Geologist Nick Mortimer was the lead author. To discover Zealandia is to change the map of the world quite literally. Previously, most people would say, yes, we got seven continents, but now the world maps change and we've got an eighth one on there. Zealandia was discovered while performing geological work aboard a research vessel off New Zealand's coast. Geological investigations have confirmed the presence of the components of the continent, including height, variety of rock types, a thick crust, and size. Situated between the Pacific Plate and the Australian Plate, tectonic forces squeeze Zealandia, raising it out of the water. With 94% of Zealandia underwater, the islands of New Zealand and New Caledonia are just the tip of this continental iceberg. Zealandia, measuring in at 4.9 million square kilometers, is six times bigger than the microcontinent of Madagascar and more than twice as large as Greenland, which is attached to North America. Zealandia's origins can be traced back to the supercontinent Gondwana. When Gondwana split apart 80 million years ago, Zealandia broke off and slowly sank due to its relatively thin continental crust. It's not as thick as the main continents, but is thicker than the ocean crust, which explains why Zealandia is so submerged. The text covers the promotion of Zealandia in the scientific arena and schools, as well as the recognition of the significance of the discovery. It then discusses the notable discovery of the 110 million year old nodosaur in Alberta, Canada, and its exceptional preservation. The specimen's skin and coloration, as well as the implications for dinosaur behavior, are highlighted. The text also mentions the protective armor of the nodosaur and ongoing research on its stomach contents to understand its diet and habitat. Lastly, it briefly touches on the asteroid impact and the theory of survival and adaptation following the dinosaur's extinction. Emerged, the surviving species expanded rapidly to fill it. This is called adaptive radiation. A recent study shows that one out of ten frog species descend from the original three frog species that survived the Cretaceous-Tertiary extinction event. Frogs were able to escape extinction for a number of reasons. They live in an aquatic habitat that offered protection. Their small size and unique metabolism allow for better endurance of environmental stress. Eventually, when vegetation returned, 
they were able to diversify worldwide and adapt to new lives in trees. Birds, too, exhibited the same adaptive radiation around the same time. A newly found 62-million-year-old mouse bird fossil in New Mexico helped paleontologists map the diversification of land birds, which can be traced back to nine original ancestors which survived the event. Warm-blooded birds' feathers insulated to them fly allowed for easier escape from hostile and barren terrain. Their diet of seeds, worms, and insects gave them the edge after much of the Earth's surface plant life had died. In the end, the ability to adapt to changing conditions proved the key characteristic for the survival of many ancient animals, including our smallest mammal ancestors, just as it may be for humans today as we confront the challenges of climate change. The city of Miami Beach already knows what it means to wade through sea level rise. In recent years, residents have experienced elevated high tides at certain times of the year known as king tides. These events are clear evidence of incremental increases. Right now, we are definitely witnessing sea level rise impacts, with these high tide flooding events growing in severity, more often deeper and more widespread. That's the sort of pattern that we expect will continue. The city of Miami Beach has committed $400 to 500 million to combat sea level highs, building water pumps, and raising their defenses. With the continuing issue of climate change and sea level rise, we're seeing an increase in water level every year. We had to make changes to adapt to this future condition. Miami Beach seeks to stay dry and take control of its future. The city believes it can meet the challenge not only in rising above in terms of elevation, but also in withstanding the challenges that come with sea level rise due to climate change. Of course, the Earth's oceans have risen and fallen many times during the planet's history. New archeological evidence suggests these shifting shorelines may conceal clues about the earliest Americans. Until just recently, archeologists generally agreed that the earliest people to populate North America were the Clovis people, dating back to some 12 to 13,000 years ago. However, a group of scientists in San Diego, California, have a different theory. They have evidence for humans in North America 130,000 years ago. The study of early humans in the New World has been very political and very controversial for over 125 years. It's an old mystery yet to be solved. Deciding who got to North America first and when. Welcome and thank you for joining us this morning at the San Diego Natural History Museum as we share some exciting news about our discovery made right here in San Diego. Back in 1992, Caltrans was doing improvements to State Route 54, which involved adding a couple of new travel lanes, and Richard Cerruti, who's a field paleontologist here at the museum, was monitoring excavations on the very north side of the freeway alignment and saw this little puff of, let's say, tusk material being scraped up by an excavator and said, stop, let me go look at this. The bones that Richard Cerruti found belonged to an ancient mastodon. That's one tooth so, and it's characteristic of American acid sharing North America with early man 130,000 years ago. The answer may lie in the position of the bones and tools found at the site. There are enormous fragrance fragments of enamel scattered throughout the site that you just don't make sense. Could these stones amongst ancient bone remnants have been an early form of primitive tools? We felt that it was important to produce a map where we carefully plotted, a precisely plotted position of all the bones and stones or whatever else is in here, so we can understand with a general pattern. It's thought that the tools found with the mastodon bones were used for butchering the animal is that we, as was used as a hammer stone 130,000 years ago, where there was a carcass of a mastodon, these people were trying to recover raw materials from it. They had a problem. How do we break these bones? They look over into the active river channel, find some cobbles of the appropriate size and weight, bring them back to the site, and if you look closely, there's some striations coming off of that that are indication of indications of where this flake has come off in this rock. This led the San Diego team to conclude that these were actually tools used by humans, an idea that Dimmer says might not be so far-fetched. Dr. Stephen Hallman is co-director of the Center for American Paleolithic Research in South Dakota. He was part of the team that evaluated the findings from the San Diego excavation site. So what we got in here? It does, I said. I can't get my mind around this. This site has to be really, really old, 
but yet here's evidence of humans, I said. It goes against everything I thought I knew, the mast of and bones and the stone tools recovered from the excavation site. We would take the drawers out of the cabinets in here and bring them on this table and look through them, paleontologists and archaeologists together. Richard Cerruti came in, so there were four of us, my wife Kathleen, Tom, and I, and we would look through, and we would look for these very diagnostic pieces. And one of the things that we got all excited about first were these cone flakes that form in a circle around the point of impact from the hammerstone. And based on the experiment that we've done in Africa, breaking an elephant femur with a big hammer, we saw the same kinds of fracture patterns that we did experimentally. Specializes in evaluating broken bones at archaeological sites, looking for human causes, as this video shows from a test he conducted in Africa, two years prior to working on the San Diego project. Oh my God. As we puzzled over this, we kept coming back to this one explanation that explains all the data was that humans did this. The detective work by the San Diego Natural History Museum team was capped by the age dating that Richard Cerruti had done to prove the age of the mastodon bones he discovered. This is one of the specimens that he used in his analysis. He cored it, and he also sliced it. After analyzing over 100 microsamples from this specimen and two other specimens of bone from the site, yielded an age of 130,000 plus or minus 9,000. So after the article came out, there has been no critic come out to say that the dating is incorrect. In fact, other specialists in uranium series dating have come out and said the dates look perfectly good. So we're very comfortable with the dates. Rival in the Americas may have occurred earlier than previously thought. New dating of another paleontological find found in a South African cave could soon upend long-held theories about the evolutionary tree of primates and early humans. When we actually got into the chamber and could start removing it, we realized that not only was there one individual line there on the surface, but the floor was literally comprised of hormonality. The text describes a variety of scientific and historical topics, including the discovery of a primitive hominin species, the benefits of seagrass meadows, pharmaceutical research on exercise pill, and the pursuit of nuclear fusion as a potential energy source. It also touches on challenges in funding for scientific research. If we were to sum up the information in a more concise manner, it would be as follows. The discovery of a primitive hominin species with an estimated age of 200,000 to 300,000 years indicates the possibility of interactions with modern humans challenging previous beliefs about human evolution in Africa. Seagrass meadows play a crucial role in purifying surrounding waters by reducing harmful bacteria, benefiting marine ecosystems, and potentially human health. Pharmaceutical research is underway to develop a drug that simulates the metabolic effects of exercise, providing potential health benefits for individuals unable to engage in physical activity. Researchers are striving to achieve nuclear fusion, a process that can generate energy, despite challenges in funding and logistical uncertainties, particularly due to Brexit and the UK's potential withdrawal from scientific agencies. The passage describes the emotional impact of a solar eclipse and then delves into various scientific discoveries and explorations, including extremophiles found in underground crystals, surprising findings on the dwarf planet Sears, the exploration of Jupiter by the Juno spacecraft, and the culmination of the Cassini mission to Saturn. The rings, thousands of miles in size, are made of pure water ice particles, some microscopic and some as large as mountains. Cassini also carried the Huygens lander, the first to land on a moon other than our own, aiming at Titan due to its unique atmosphere. Later, Cassini captured massive water jets from Enceladus, collecting organic molecules, hinting at potential microbial life. This brings hope in the search for extraterrestrial life, including the discovery of the Trappist-1 system and its potentially habitable planets. This remarkable progress fuels our excitement about the continuing exploration of our universe.